One question that came in, um, I pulled up this slide because it will give some context, but the question is, uh, is there any chance of New York State quarantine zones being created as Spotted Lanternfly expands? Um, would someone from Agate Markets maybe want to talk about that? Sure. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, an effective regulatory program is key to control. Um, and so that's part of trying to make sure that uh, Spotted Lanternfly isn't artificially spread. So one of the first things we did is enact an exterior quarantine, which is a quarantine on other states that have it. That has since changed because we now have spotted lantern fly here in New York. So uh, there is a draft regulation uh, that is in review in our agency um, that should come out at some point here uh, that will establish a quarantine in New York um, to help prevent uh, the artificial spread of, of, of spotted lantern fly uh, throughout New York. Um, and we do this typically. This is a um, this isn't something new for New York State Ag and Markets. We have some pretty long-standing quarantines. Um, the, the most recent was Emerald Ash Borer, uh, which unfortunately, um, you know, Emerald Ash Borer moved through the state. Uh, but I will say that um, if you look at other states, neighboring states that abandoned the regulatory approach, um, those states became very quickly infested. And so that insect was able to spread uh, with great ease. Um, we still have many pockets within the state of New York that are not infested with Emerald Ash Borer. Um, and that infestation was first found in 2009. So um, we're many years from that time frame, and we still uh, have some have some counties that have no infestation in them at all, which is great. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle, which Tom worked on years ago, uh, that's still an active quarantine. We're down to one quarantine. We're able to control that pest and, and eradicate it in uh, in New York City. We've got one quarantine on Long Island. But we're still actively pursuing eradication program. So regulations have been proven to work. Gypsy moths still the spread. Regulation is another one uh, that's worked really well in the Northeast and in the Mid Atlantic states. So regulations can work. I know they're not not popular, um, but that that is they're they are an effective tool, um, and so we do have that tool in our toolbox, and we do we do use it when we feel it's necessary. And in this case, uh, given the impacts of this pest, we do feel it's necessary. And like with any regulation, uh, a whole set of rules that we have to follow. Public hearings, public comments, and all those types of things. So, uh, if you're concerned about the regulations or want to make comments, uh, you'll be able to see that when it gets posted in the register uh, and gets posted out for public comment. You can you can supply your your comments to the agency at that time. Golden nematode is another great example of a long-term um, effective quarantine that, that's been in place since the, you know the 1940s. Um, and, and we are still the only state, you know, due to that quarantine, we're still the only state to have golden nematode. Um, another thing is that the USDA is not planning, has not enacted, and is probably not planning on, on a state, you know, interstate quarantine. Um, so it would be up to the states, individual states at this point, which it's been uh, several of the other states, Pennsylvania, for example, have individual quarantines. Yeah, and to Tom's point, uh... Just to kind of touch on that, typically when there's a, a plant pest of, of this kind of significance, you do see the federal government, USDA, come in and establish a, uh, a quarantine, a federal quarantine. Um, and it's actually a, a pretty good thing because it establishes a level playing field for interstate commerce uh, because that's the federal government's responsibility is movement interstate. It can't control the movement within the state. That's the state's right. Uh, but what happens in the absence of a federal quarantine is you get several states enacting their own quarantine regulations, and those regulations are different. And so for the regulated community, those that have to adhere to those regulations, they have all these different standards. And so there is a, a little bit of a harmonization uh, going on uh, where the states have come together and try to uh, standardize the language, uh, try to provide reciprocity amongst the states. So if you have a permit in one state, other states will accept it. So we are trying to work with our partners in other states to make sure that those regulations are pretty standardized across the board to help businesses and, and other entities comply and and again try to eliminate the confusion that there is around uh, uh, quarantines and regulations thank you and we got a question that could be related to this I'm wondering if there are any 
success stories for spotted lanternfly, like in Pennsylvania. So there's quarantines in place. Have those been effective in Pennsylvania um, in the spread from some regions to other regions? Or are there any other sorts of success that has been had in Pennsylvania that we could learn from? I would say um, that Pennsylvania, despite the map that you see here, could be considered a success story in the fact that if you take a look at um, South Korea and geographically the, south, the size of South Korea is roughly the size of Pennsylvania, very small country, they had an introduction of, of spotted lanternfly and that spotted lanternfly spread throughout that country wildly. Um, Pennsylvania has had it for a number of years. Its first uh, sighting is 2014. So we're, we're, you know, going on seven years here and um, it has not spread to every part of the state. Um, and within four years in South Korea, it had spread very easily throughout. So, you know, I applaud the efforts of our, our counterparts in Pennsylvania, specifically uh, Penn State University, Pennsylvania Department of Ag and, and, uh, and USDA. Um, I think if, if Pennsylvania um, had more resources, which is always an issue for every state, you know, having the having the uh, adequate amount of resources to put the time and money and effort behind it, they probably could have been even more successful. Um, but uh, they they had a really sound strategy. They went after it as aggressive as aggressive as they could, um, and um, you know, we're really sounding the the alarm for all of us to be aware of it. And so, um, I think the success story there is is getting all the states aware. Getting the public aware um, and, and and doing a great job of trying to limit its spread, uh, even though the map may look disheartening, um, you, you take into account what they had to work with and the time and compare it to South Korea. I think uh, they have been successful in, in limiting its spread. Um, the other the other factor that comes into play is with new pests. There's a lot to be learned. There's a lot of science. There's a lot of research that needs to take place. And so when you're the first state to deal with a pest. There's a lot of unknowns, and there's still a lot of unknowns to this day on this particular pest. You know, the question was, you know, is Tree of Heaven's preferred species? At one point, we couldn't answer that question. We can answer that now. Um, you know, it doesn't need it to survive. There's a there's still a lot of questions around spotted lanternfly. Those help manage those help manage us in terms of making our decisions, how we apply resources, decision making. Uh, all of those things come into play if you have good science. They didn't, they did the best they could with what they knew and then adapted as science uh, told them, you know, these are the different things that we are now aware of with this particular pest. So I think overall, I would call Pennsylvania a success story. Um, and there's many, many stories within Pennsylvania that you can show as, as success. Great education outreach through Penn State University, uh, great regulatory program and permitting system through Penn State and, and Pennsylvania Department of Ag. And it just, more than gracious with their time with all the states uh, in, in trying to help us prepare. So, thank you. So, another question we have in the QA is if we come across SLF instars or gypsy moth cat caterpillars, what is the recommended method of killing them uh, once they're past the egg stage? It might be two different questions. Yeah. And you know what, if we can go to that uh, image that has the uh, leaf, so it's mostly green, maybe it's, yeah, there it is. Perfect. So um, I took this picture in Pennsylvania a few weeks ago. We probably have that uh, where it was warmer than it is uh, in New York. And so for those locations in New York, we're probably looking at something like this right now. So nothing like, it looks nothing like the adult. Um, and that's what uh, we're talking about. So what's the best way to kill those? Um, there are traps that can be used. These uh, juveniles are uh, captured in those traps and we have an image of the trap. If we could go to that. So this is a circle trap and this is kind of what they've arrived at. You know, Ethan was talking about um, Pennsylvania going into this blind because no one had to contend with this insect to this level before and Pennsylvania learned that you know this trap is one of the best ways to capture the insects both the juveniles and the adults and uh, there are sticky traps I don't have a picture of those we have some hesitancy in recommending those because they can give us collateral damage you can catch birds and bats and uh, things we don't want to catch 
with uh, some of the wide band sticky traps. But these are relatively safe for wildlife. And what happens is that these uh, spotted lanternflies have the drive to go up the tree trunk and they get funneled in this netting to the bag at the end. They drop down to the bag and they have to feed. And after a day or two without being able to feed, they die in that bag. And that bag then is emptied periodically. Uh, so that's one way to control them. These uh, insect are relatively easy to control with insecticides too. So if it's in your own property uh, and you have a labeled insecticide, you might wanna do that. It's important to remember though, that the spotted lanternflies don't bite, they don't sting, they don't get inside. They're not a household nuisance like the stink bugs are. So um, you have to decide that it's important to uh, want to control them. They will uh, suck the sap from the tree and it can be a nuisance with the honeydew that falls and sooty mold that might grow on top of that. But if we go down to uh, the slide that just has the portion of the map, I'd like to point something out there. So at New York State IPM, we're keeping a list of the insecticides that are available to uh, control uh, spotted lanternfly, and you'll find that on the right-hand side, right at the top there, it says insecticides for use on spotted lanternfly. So at this point, there's just a few that can be used, um, but we'll be uh, updating that. So we have a special list for the grape growers and one for landscapers, and it'll include, it does include um, products available for consumers as well. I, I just want to add, as far as reporting them, um, IMAP Invasives is a great tool. It's the, it's the state database. So we can, they can be reported through IMAP Invasives. They can re, be reported at the uh, perfect screen there, right in the middle of the page. It says spotted lantern fly report. Oh, oh, back it, right it, there with the red. Right <laughs> so we could, you know, they can be reported through that site, uh, which goes directly to us. Um, that that reporting site is also available on the DEC site. It's available on our site, New York State Parks, um, even I believe New York State DOT. It's uh, it's in the, it's at our website. Uh, you can hit the hyperlink that reports to us, which looks like you're pulling up if you scroll down, or you can email us at spottedlanternfly at agriculture.ny.gov. But all the way down to the bottom of our website here. And we do have Michael G. and Volvo on the, on, on the call here, who uh, is the person that uh, everybody that sends in these things gets. So Michael, do you have any comments you want to, on the responding uh, for Spotted Lanternfly? I would just say that if you have any suspicion that you might have Spotted Lanternfly in your area um, and you can take a picture of, of what makes you think that it might be there, Definitely send it in. Don't hesitate. Uh, we review lots of false reports, and it's really no problem. You know, we get a lot of gypsy moth uh, reports in. Um, they do. Bag masses are a similar size and can be a similar color, um, and it's understandable why someone might mistake them for spy lantern fly. But uh, and there's you know there's other spy lantern fly lookalikes out there that to the untrained eye might might appear like spy lantern fly. So just uh, don't hesitate to email us or use that form if you think you might have spy lantern fly in your area. One thing I wanted to get to also was that if you think you have it, um, you know, please report it. Don't just kill it, squish it. Uh, we, you know, if it's especially if it's in an area where we don't know it exists, if it's a new pocket or you know a new infestation, or if it's spread from an existing infestation, we want to know that so we can survey uh, the area. So we can adjust our survey techniques and uh, or even our regulatory uh, to that area. Um, so it's it's important to not just crush it and kill it. Um, to you know report it, please, please, please report it. So I should also say that IMAP invasives is a is also an effective way to report by the lantern fly. We'd like to go that road. And, and I would add that um, you know you you look for them now you didn't see any juveniles don't give up because the adults are so much more noticeable 
than uh, the juveniles are. I mean, when we focus in on them and they have the nice black and white insect, that's one thing, but um, the adults will much be uh, much easier to recognize. Thank you. And so we have just a small handful of questions left. So one question I have is, what is being done about spotted lanternfly in New York? And so I've heard about many things being done about spotted lanternfly in New York. So I was wondering, does anything anyone would like to reiterate or something that we've missed? I think we're, you know, we're, we're intensively surveying and looking for it. Um, we looked at the areas uh, that have it and done assessments on uh, how we're best going to uh, handle uh, the, the limited resources we have to tackle it um, and where we can have the greatest impact. Um, and so we are looking at treatment options, um, you know, obviously survey options in terms of uh, visual survey and trapping, as was mentioned earlier. And then lastly, you know, the regulatory approach that will be coming out here in the next couple months. Um, and so, you know, I think the biggest take home message for the folks that are on the uh, uh, on the meeting here, you know, is, is to be aware of it, you know, to be aware of where it is and make sure that if you're in those areas that you're not, uh, you're not contributing to its spread and to educate your friends and family and neighbors as best you can. Uh, you know, even if you're traveling, traveling down to Pennsylvania, traveling down to New Jersey, you're traveling to those states that are infested. It is very, very, very easy for these pests to hitchhike. They're very good at it. Tom mentioned their eggs. They can lay their eggs on virtually anything. That's one way. The other way is they can get on anything. Uh, give you a quick story. Uh, I was down in Pennsylvania. We went out to look at a site. We were in a university uh, bus, a bunch of researchers and regulatory officers, and we went out, checked each other, got in the bus, in the van, went back to the university, got out, and the, and the bench in front of me was a dead spot on lanternfly that had snuck in on one of the passengers. It's that easy. Uh, if it hadn't been dead, it could have jumped off, and you know, if it was a female or others, could have started a new infestation. So I think it's it's very easy to spread this thing. We need the public's help to be diligent and make sure that they aren't spreading it. That that leads into what I wanted to share was uh, outreach. It's something that we've been doing preemptively before it arrived in New York when we knew it was in the neighboring states. So we've, we've been doing public outreach events you know, for years now. Um, it's kind of intensified now that it's here in New York State. Events like this, uh, events like we held earlier this afternoon it was the uh, you know, the claim a grid square training that we're doing with IMAP invasive. So you can, you know, there are grids that are claimable and you can survey those grids multiple times in a year uh, for spotted lantern fly. So you can actively participate in survey uh, as a citizen scientist. Um, we'll actively reaching out to, you know, trucking associations, you know, stakeholders that aren't typical for agricultural pests. Uh, we're working with other state partners. You know, we recognize the other states' permits, uh, especially you know the gold standard would be the one in Pennsylvania. So we're working with our state partners. We're working cooperatively with the USDA. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a team effort. You know, all hands on deck kind of thing, uh, which includes you know citizen scientists. Um, we're certainly working with the prisms, and and they have various degrees of engagement depending on on their resources. Um, so between the public, the prisms, the other states, uh, you know, outreach, outreach, and outreach. I know Michael and, and, and Brian do a lot of that. Uh, I've, we've all done some of it, but I think Brian and, and Michael do, you know, my, Michael sends out brochures every Friday, you know, for requests and all that material is in the hands of people that need it. Um, so outreach is another huge aspect of what we're doing um, is we can't survey everywhere in the state, but, you know, it, it, the more citizen scientists that we have recruited to help with that survey, you know, the more likely that someone's going to report this pest uh, as with most invasive species, somebody sees something that doesn't seem right. They report it and we follow up on it. Many, many invasive species have been found that way. Um, so, you know, we, we're not in this alone. We definitely need folks help. Yeah. Yeah. So we're preparing our grape industry is is 1 thing to through that outreach that's probably not visible to the typical citizen and also um, research is being conducted in New York in contained facilities on um, biological control. So there are some fungi that feed upon uh, the spotted lanternfly. They were found naturally occurring in Pennsylvania. They're looking at ways to 
uh, reproduce those fungi so they, those could be used as kind of a natural pesticide. Very cool. Yeah, that actually answered one of the last two questions, the biocontrol. So thank you for that. And then our last question before we'll wrap up is, so it kind of relates to what Ethan was just saying. So some examples of large populations of spotted lanternfly would be Staten Island, New Jersey, uh, some parts of Pennsylvania. Um, what are the the biggest vectors that could spread spotted lanternfly in the next few years, and how could we uh, try to uh, prevent that? I know Ethan was saying that it can spread in pretty much any way, but is there any any particular way that we're most concerned about? Well, I think if you look at the infestations that we have and, and where we've surveyed and where we find concentrations, um, they do seem to be centered around parking lots. So if you look at the situation in Ithaca, it was a um, Greek life apartment complex area where there were a number of cars parked. If you look at Slotesburg, that's on I-87, That's there's a rest area there. Uh, if you look at Orangeburg, you know, the heart of that infestation is centered around a couple parking lots near some commercial stores. Same thing with Port Jervis. So when we look at it, you know, what you, what you start putting everything together, vehicles, people, you know, uh, and so in parks, you know, for New York State Office of Parks, they focus on their trailheads because they've seen a lot of activity for spot on to fly there. Same thing with DEC. So I think people are the number one vector. And, you know, we have focused very heavily on the commercial side of things with truck inspections and things of that nature. We'll also be doing some railroad inspections uh, this year. Uh, but I think the common, you know, the common vehicle just moving from one location to another is the easiest vector for this thing to move because you're not thinking about it. Um, you're just thinking, well, I just traveled from this area to that area. And you're not thinking about where you were, how spotted lantern fly might have gotten in your vehicle, where it might have gone to. Um, or if your camper was parked outside or your boat was parked outside over winter, you know, and in the fall, did it get eggs laid on it and then you move that. Um, so I think people, you know, in, in their vehicles and how they move, um, you know, with Emerald Ashport was firewood, you know, that was really focused on firewood. I think this one moves so easily. Um, people really, you know, how they move, what they move and everything associated with that is, is key. And I know that doesn't narrow it down, but um, that's really the, the the biggest issue for us that we see where we find these infestations usually centered around parking lots and not commercial usually uh you know just passenger vehicles thank you um and so i think that was our closing question so i think we can start to wrap up now so first i'll say thank you so much to uh the group of people we had with us today it was really Great to hear your questions. I hope you uh, got something out of this and learned some things about spot lanternfly. And I'm also so thankful to our panel of experts from agriculture markets and IPM. Um, and so I'll ask um, if anyone has any closing remarks. Um, I know some of you gave some uh, ideas of some things we missed, like the education aspect and stuff. Um, but is there anything else, anything anyone would like to share before we sign out for the night? Just sign up to use IMAP invasives, report IMAP, re report invasives. This is the great week for it. You know, we're focusing on not just spot and lantern fly, but all invasive species. That's the whole purpose of ISAW. So, you know, yeah. uh, get involved. There are, you know, it's the beginning of the week. So there, the ISAW runs all week through Saturday. Um, you know, there, there's lots of events statewide, you know, check your prison websites. Um, you know, there, there, there's lots of events where you can actually go and participate even if it's remotely, uh, you know, in your own backyard, you know, the, the claim of grid square is a good example. Um, but there are many ways you can contribute to invasive species awareness week here in New York this year. So appreciate your time and your concern. And, you know, I hope the participants that are live and the, those that you see this as a recording, you know, can actively in, engage in, you know, citizen science. Yes, thanks so much. Brian, are you about to say something? Uh, just, you know, um, if you see something you're not sure about, do not hesitate to report it. Yes, definitely. It's much better to correct a false report than to not get a report. Um, so, yes, definitely. And one thing I'll also add is, so 
Um, obviously, we, we're using the grid square map to try to get people to go to some key areas, but really um, keeping your eyes open anywhere, whether or not you're in a grid square is really, really valued and we would really all benefit from spotted lanternfly surveys or any invasive species surveys, really wherever you are, wherever you look and wherever you happen upon invasive species. Um, so with that, thanks so much to uh, Tom, Brian, Ethan, and Michael. Um, and thank you to the other IMAP folks who helped out with the questions today. And most of all, thank you to uh, everyone who's attending these events. And I encourage you to go to nyisaw.org to see what else is going on this week. And thanks, Good night, to, everybody. Thanks to our host. Oh, thank you. <laughs>